know me, know how I earn a living. This shark swallow you whole. I value my neck a lot more than three thousand bucks, chief. Find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. Ten thousand dollars for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. You yell, Charles. We've got a panic on our hands on the Fourth of July. Mr. Gorn, Mr. Gorn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck hull of the boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. A what? You're going to need a bigger boat. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. Now, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. to another episode of the Jaws Obsession, where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Thank you very much for returning. Here we are with episode 62, Jaws Dogs. That's right, the dogs of Jaws. With the run of the Jaws Obsession, we've had a few emails over the last many months asking about the other victim of Bruce the Shark in Jaws. Pippet the dog. So why not have an episode about Pippet the dog? But while we're doing that, can we find other dogs that are in the movie Jaws and highlight them as well? But before we get to all that, we have some Jaws news and we have some listener emails to get to, which have some great questions there. But there's a, a couple of Book of Quint reviews coming in. First, I'd like to start off by thanking you, the listener out there in the Jaws obsession, for making episode 61 uh, ben Gardner's Death Explained, the most downloads and streams across all platforms since the show began. We have many new listeners to the show. I'd like to welcome everyone. It's exciting to see the listenership increase and activity increase across all platforms. Very great to see. Thank you very much for returning, for lending your time. I know you are busy, and it's always great to take a break and talk about the greatest movie ever made, Jaws, and see if we could find out what's going on in the Jaws universe. So with that, let's jump into Jaws news. One big announcement in the Jaws world is that Ian Shaw, son of Robert Shaw, his play The Shark is Broken is now coming to Broadway. It will be appearing on Broadway in New York City. So Ian Shaw stars as his father, actor Robert Shaw, in a piece inspired by his iconic perform performance as Quint and his stories of choppy waters on set. So that play that had a West End run in uh, London then came to Toronto, Canada, and now it is going to be a Broadway play showing on Broadway right there at the Golden Theater, 252 West 45th Street between Broadway and 8th Avenue. You don't get any more on Broadway than that. Very exciting to see. Congratulations to Mr. Shaw for this next great step in that play's arc. Uh, very exciting to see. The first preview date is July 25th, 2023, with opening date August 10th, 2023. And it's going to be running all the way through to November 19th, 2023 for United States and North American uh, fans of Jaws. This is your time to go see Ian Shaw play his father. And it is an excellent, excellent performance. It's a Jaws fan's dream to see uh, what happens on stage in this play. So I encourage anyone, if anyone that has not seen the play yet, 
uh, throughout the United States, uh, plan a trip and get over there uh, between uh, July 25th. That's when the preview dates start, but it's going to be August 10th is the official opening date all the way to November 19th, 2023. I'll put the link for the telecharge.com site for The Shark is Broken in the description of this broadcast. Or you can go to the website, thesharkisbroken.com, thesharkisbroken.com. So exciting to see Mr. Shaw bringing his play where he plays his dad, uh, Robert Shaw, on the set of Jaws w- inside the Orca. It's, a, it's an extremely unique setup. Absolutely an amazing experience for any Jaws fan out there. Highly recommend it here. And look at that. He's keeping Quint in the media. Quint is alive and well. And the character is going strong. So it's very exciting to see all these pieces happening at the same time. Coming right out of the Jaws obsession, we have our own, we're making our own waves in the Jaws news world. I have a small announcement here. There's a press release that I'll be putting out with that uh, coincides with this episode. It's called A Novel Celebration for Robert Shaw, The Book of Quint. It reads In 1927, legendary actor Robert Shaw was born in West Houghton and would become one of Great Britain's most prized actors. 96 years later, a novel inspired by Robert Shaw's performance as Quint in Jaws will arrive in West Houghton, adding to the legacy of the great actor. The novel tells the backstory of Quint from surviving the sinking of the USS Indianapolis tragedy to his arrival on Amity Island and the rise of the legendary vessel Orca. As the Book of Quint seeks publication in the UK, The novel is currently in development for a big screen adaptation with the William Pettit Agency in the United States. A worldwide release of the book is expected later in 2023. Author Ryan Daco, host of the Jaws Obsession podcast, will be visiting the UK to deliver some of the last remaining hardcover books from the limited printing of the Book of Quint. Only 300 books were made after a successful Indiegogo crowdsource campaign held in 2022. The Book of Quint will now be officially available at the West Houghton Library in Bolton. All are invited to a special meeting on July 1st, 2023 at the Robert Shaw Weatherspoon Pub from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. where the legacy of Robert Shaw will be celebrated. Author Ryan Daco will be on hand to meet UK listeners of the Jaws Obsession and UK Jaws fans as well as present the Book of Quint to West Houghton. An introduction by the author, followed by a special reading of from the Book of Quint, a short question and answer with readers and fans of Robert Shaw, and then three books will be raffled off to those who attend. Proceeds from the raffle will go to a UK-based shark research and conservation charity. It's is a celebration of the actor Robert Shaw with a new addition to the Jaws universe, the Book of Quint. And so that is very exciting to read that here on the Jaws Obsession. We did a lot of work. You, the listener, and you, the supporter of the Book of Quint, and everything that we're trying to do with an expanded Jaws universe uh, has made this possible. With the great help from Hayden Wheeler over in the UK, he runs Jaws Obsession UK over on Twitter and Facebook. And from there, he was lining up a Jaws Obsession UK meetup. And this was a great opportunity to make the Book of Quint available to the public. And this is going to be the first time that the Book of Quint is available to the available to the public and from a library setting. So it is only fitting that this would be in Robert Shaw's hometown where the where Robert Shaw was born in West Houghton, Bolton, UK, uh, the greater Manchester area. Very exciting. It's an honor and a privilege to actually be able to be in this position to go over there and meet the Jaws fans from um, from the UK. Uh, to meet all of uh, those who have been writing in and listening over the uh, since December of 2021 to the Jaws Obsession. We're going to have a lot of fun talking about Jaws and also reveling in the excitement that the Book of Quint is here, it's real, and it's now going to be available to the schools. Or I'm going to be bringing over copies for the schools of West Houghton, and, and we have some special announcements. We're going to have Hayden on the show in the next episode, and we're going to get more details And we're going to hear more about that in the near future. So that's all going to be on July 1st, Saturday, July 1st, 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at the Robert Shaw Witherspoon Pub, 3440 Market Street, West Houghton, Bolton. You can always go to our website at jawsob.com. There's going to be the press release is going to be on the notes page. So exciting to be lining up this trip. This is going to be 
Uh, the first time I actually get to see England outside of Heathrow. I've only seen England from the inside of the airport there. And now I finally, and, and so it's uh, excellent to go to Manchester, which is um, kind of, uh, it's, that's almost a mythical city to me. You have to realize, I, growing up, that's some of my favorite bands listening to music growing up from the Smiths to Oasis. Uh, they're all from Manchester, and it's just, it's not surprising that the greater Manchester area produced the, in my mind, the greatest actor to ever grace the silver screen from UK Shores, Robert Shaw. So it's uh, what what an area. I can't wait to go and do some research there. This is all working out for the research phase for the next book. So we're going to try to get some sort of uh, recording going uh, from that event, and maybe that will be broadcasted here. So whoever cannot make it there, we're going to make sure that somehow you'll be able to see what happens. With the limited copies of the Book of Quint, there was only 300 made. I have been getting emails, especially since episode 61 aired, where we have now an increased listenership. Um, I did not state on episode 61 that we are out of books. We have only a limited amount left for promotional purposes. So in order to maximize the amount of readers to have access to the Book of Quint with these limited copies, I felt it was best to try to work that into the library setting to uh, so the public will have access to these books it, while we all wait for the publishing world to come around and actually get a worldwide release of the Book of Quint. So then you can order it on all the different outlets. So that's all still being worked out. But in the meantime... Why can't we put these books out where anyone will be able to go over and check them out or sit down and actually just be able to read them while the wait is happening? This is not the last library, but this will definitely be the first library where readers will be able to find the Book of Quint. Thank you very much, Hayden Wheeler, for setting a lot of this up. And there is a lot, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of plates spinning and wheels turning in order to make this work. So it's exciting to see um, the, uh, there's the historical, the uh, community initiative in West Houghton is uh, responding very positively to this event. And it's very exciting to see. With that, let's get into some emails. If you want to email the show, you can always email here at jawsob2025 at gmail.com. Tim writes in from, looks like he writes in from England. He says, hi, just to congratulate you on the podcast. It's nice to know there's people out there as fanatic about Jaws as I am. I'm late to the podcast and wondered if there's any way of purchasing the Book of Quint. Keep up the good work. Cheers, Tim. From Lincolnshire in the UK. And uh, so, Tim, this is uh, you're not alone. I've, I've received many emails uh, regarding uh, how to find the Book of Quint. And unfortunately, we are out right now. I just want to restate that the limited edition has run its course. Now we are in talks with various publishers as far as doing any other runs, limited edition runs. Once again, I knew that this was, I, I remember that was one of my biggest fears was this moment was um, was when there was going to be interest and people were going to want to read the book and we were not going to be able to have enough books. So unfortunately, we are here, so we're going to try to make the best of it. But I can assure you that the Book of Quint is coming. My pie-in-the-sky hope is the Book of Quint will be available uh, later this year as it approaches the holiday season. That's what I really want to push for that. So the Book of Quint will be available to be ordered for the holidays. Wouldn't that be nice? But in the meantime, if you are in England like Tim is, please, if you can get up to the Robert Shaw on July 1st at the Weathers Weatherspoon Pub uh, in Bolton, I will be there on hand, and we're going to be raffling off three books. So we're going to be holding a raffle, selling raffle tickets. I believe it's a pound a ticket to raise money for a UK-based shark research charity. And there's your chance. You got to. You're going to have a chance to win. We're going to be raffling off three books there, or you can just plan a trip up there to Robert Shaw's hometown, and then just go right into the library, and you can read it there as well. So it's there's there's ways of happening. There's ways of making that happen if you are over in the UK. So thanks very much for writing in, Tim. We have a couple of reviews here. Heath from Georgia writes in, and he says, Hey, Ryan, I just wanted to let you know what an incredible book that Book of Quint was. I was happy and lucky enough to help with the Indiegogo campaign to play a small part in helping get the next chapter of Jaws off the ground. Ryan, you did such a great job of tying both Jaws and Jaws 2 back together with the Book of Quint. The Book of Quint captured the same energy as the movie Jaws. 
The novel is a worthy prequel to the greatest movie of all time. Your love for the movie shows throughout the book by the amount of detail and careful observations with each character. The novel grabs you by opening with the USS Indianapolis story and seeing the events through Quint's eyes. And the second and third part of the book are just as engaging with the story being told by Herschel Salvatore, along with the development and growth of Amity Island. And being born in 1975, there has never been a time in my life that I do not remember Jaws. Same with me, Heath. That's the same with me. I was born in 78, and we just grew up. Jaws was always a part of our lives. Uh, both myself, my brother, and my father were and are huge fans of the movie. And now I have introduced my daughter to the film as well. And she loved it so much that we had to watch all the sequels, including Jaws 4. Yes, it is still as bad as I remember it being in the movie theater in 1987. Sorry, Dad, to have made you take us to that awful movie. Two words, Roaring Shark. <laughs> it's true. I, I saw Jaws 4 in the theater as well. It was the first uh, movie that uh, my sister, my older sister Tiffany and I, we actually went there. I don't know if was that, it was, I think it was PG-13. And it was the first movie that we were able to go see without the parents which was kind of cool. So we were there. I thought, you know, as you know, how old was I? I was nine years old, nine or 10. So she, um, but yeah, it was, uh, it doesn't hold up well over time, huh? That Jaws the Revenge. Heath continues on. <laughs> so he, Heath continues on. Anyway, I knew my brother and father would love to read the, would love to read the book of Quinn as well. So I bought each of them a copy through the Crack Bean Roastery. Ryan, I just wanted to say thank you for writing the next chapter in the Jaws story and for the incredible job that you do on the Jaws Obsession. Take care of yourself, sir. And that was Heath from Georgia. He got his copies and bought one for his brother and father through the Crack Bean Roastery. Remember, the Crack Bean Roastery is still the official coffee of the Jaws Obsession. I am drinking it now as I record this episode. And uh, we hope to have some uh, uh, Jaws-themed something coming up through the Crack Bean Roastery coming up soon. I'm waiting for word on that, but that's going to be very exciting. That's another little... These, see, these are little things that we can do with an expanded Jaws universe. We can actually have new things come into the world. Now, the Book of Quint ushers in um, a new vibe where there should be new avenues for artistic avenues, artistic uh, inspirations. I've already seen some listeners of the Jaws Obsession, like Alex over in Spain. He, he's creating these uh, really neat hats and uh, shirts and that, well, that I see on his Instagram while he's uh, fishing. He's wearing a Book of Quint hat or a Jaws Obsession hat. Uh, we have Dale over in the UK is working on some T-shirts. This is, this is just great stuff to see because that's what the Jaws does is that the Book of Quint should do the same is that just expand our minds and look at a bigger Jaws universe and expanded opportunities to see more things related to Jaws come into this world. Uh, very cool to see. And, uh, and we're working on that too here at the Jaws Obsession. So it's very cool to see. Thank you very much, Heath, for the review. This whole process started in August, of, back in the summer of 2020. So this has been a long time to get here and to see Jaws fans responding to the Book of Quint in this way. It helps a lot. It really does because all these reviews I've assembled into one giant file that got sent over to my agent who represents the Book of Quint, Bill Pettit, at the William Pettit Agency in Atlanta, Georgia. And this is all helpful as the publishers are reviewing the Book of Quint to know that there is an attached fan base, to know that there is a following and the fans of Jaws are excited about it. This all helps. So when you voice your uh, when you voice this uh, this type of approval here and uh, the comment section of whatever podcast platform you're listening on, whether it's Spotify, Apple, Pandora, or Audible, even on YouTube, if you leave a good uh, a five-star review for the Jaws Obsession and maybe talk about what you're seeing or hearing, this all helps. We can actually approach and show that we are bringing not just the Book of Quint, but we are bringing an attached fan following as well. And that helps things. And, and trust me, it helps things a lot. So thank you very much, Heath, for writing in. Uh, we had another great review come in uh, this was a partial review. See, I, I, I always encourage uh, anyone that's reading the Book of Quint, I like partial reviews too because I like to know what people are thinking at what time and what at, at, in the book and 
it, it, was it working at this time? And because there's a, when you're when you're writing a novel, there's a lot of planning how the story is told. And at what point do uh, ha, was I able to take the reader and what are the emotions they're feeling at this point and does that work? That helps me become a better writer myself. So this kind of type of feedback is very, is very exciting. So the partial review I received from Sarah over in England, and she said, so here I am a few months into you sending me the book. I have been in a quandary. I was desperate to read it straight away, but also my OCD with books and having to have them immaculate I haven't wanted to open the cellophane and dirty the book, but my obsession with Jaws and therefore the Book of Quint took over and I am sitting here 42 pages in and unable to put it down. I cannot believe you are a new writer. I have read many books over my 54 years on this wonderful earth. And I have to be honest, I have never been so gripped from page one. Your writing, prose, and complete attention to detail is incomprehensible. I am astounded by it and in complete awe. I know that this will be one of the quickest books I have read by ease and content, all with quietly turning the lovely paper that you have used for the book, ready then to put it back in its cellophane and have it pride of place in my huge book collection. Thank you, Ryan, for providing this wonderful piece of history. That's Sarah over in the UK. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that exceptional partial review. She's 42 pages in and says she cannot put it down. And she can't believe that I am a new writer. That's true. This is my first novel that I ever tackled. My history came from a a screenwriting background, as well as I used to be a writer for um, different magazines. I wrote some articles in Muscle Car magazines, as well as uh, Billiard, a billiard publication. Because I was, uh, at one time, I was a, a serious pool player as well. So there were some articles, and those articles always had to do with movies and whatever that topic is. So my my forte was uh, car chase scenes and how cars were used in movies, and that was in a few uh, muscle car magazines. And then, of course, how was um, how was the game of billiards and pool portrayed in movies from The Hustler and Color of Money and uh, from writing articles in magazines, I, can't, I I would have to work with editors and figure out how to write concisely and to the point in order to grip the reader in a short amount of time, but also include uh, details that you might have missed inside those, uh, those movies and scenes. So that's sort of where my storytelling mindset comes from. But this is my first novel, so it's a, and it's quite... It's quite the compliment, and I take it with a. Uh, with a I, I, and I'm very grateful to see that such an experienced reader as Sarah is, who has a very huge book collection, is already intrigued with the Book of Quint, 42 pages in. Uh, so the UK and literature have a have, have a deep, deep, deep history. When I hear reviews like this from UK readers, I go, okay, we're onto something here. Uh, you know, writing is very is a very solitary activity. It's like shooting an arrow into the forest. You really don't even know if it's going to land in the right spot. And then to hear feedback from readers lets you know that, okay, your instincts are correct here. And that's what I use this feedback going forward is how can I make changes? How can I better myself? The Book of Quint is not without mistakes. Trust me, I have eight, eight different revisions and stuff still jumps out at the page at me. And, and some of you listening out there, have emailed me lists, which we will be, I'll be working. Obviously there will be another revision as it goes into a publisher's hands. So these are all, this is all part of the process. It's all part of the process of writing and and publishing a novel. And uh, it's great to see. So thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much for writing in. Uh, Wonderful to see such a, um, such a passionate review like that. And I can't wait to hear what you think after the book is finished. Uh, Vic writes in, I recently began listening to your podcast, and I just wanted to say what a pleasure it is to hear someone appreciate Jaws as much as I do. It has always been my favorite film, and I lost count after 75 or so viewings, probably close to 100 now. I'm 52 years old and can barely remember seeing it in the theater when I was four, but I do remember bits and pieces. Ben Gardner's head, show me the way to go home. I clearly remember thinking Quint wasn't going to die. The whole theater loved him, laughed with him. Even after the second bite and he's screaming and stabbing away at, and little me thought, well, he's going to stab the shark and kill it. I was four. What did I know? Then the third bite and it was over. Damn. 
Still the greatest movie death of all time. Thanks for all you do and keep up the good work. Episode 61 this week about Ben Gardner was the best by far. Riveting, actually, and maybe the best episode yet. Only a Jaws nerd would be fascinated by a 40-minute breakdown of how Ben Gardner actually died, and that nerd is me. Sincerely, Victor in White Plains, New York. Thank you so much, Vic, for writing in. You're so correct. We all felt that way when Quint dies in Jaws. If you think about it, we we only know Quint for so many. It's a, it's a two-hour movie, and Quint's not really in the whole movie, but you get so close to him, and you're so intrigued by Robert Shaw's performance, so that, that character just stays with you. When he dies, we all feel that loss. Part of my process of the book of Quint was that we lost Quint too fast, and there was so much more to this rich, deep character that I was feeling And that is what was the groundswell behind the push to write the book of Quint. Uh, There's a lot, it's a bigger story than that, but that's, uh, that was the basis of it. I can't wait for you to read the book of Quint and then see how, how many layers of this character and how deep, how deep he really, he really goes. Vic also said that episode 61, Ben Gardner's death explained was the best by far. Episode 61 was quite the episode that we, we broke a 50 year old mystery there about how Ben Gardner died using various guests. And it was exciting to see that was one of that, that actually is one of my favorite too. That, so that, that episode came out excellent. Um, was very fun to do, and it's uh, nice to see that that was the first impression of many people that got brought into the Jaws obsession. They played that first, and they said, whoa, what is going on here? So so now they're going back and listening to the entire back catalog, which is exciting as well. So thank you very much, Vic, for that compliment. Uh, we hope to get to more revelations here with this episode with uh, Pippet the dog. And I like that. I like if you, and if you ever have any questions or if you ever see anything in Jaws that you have any questions about, that's what this is. This is the, this is our late night diner uh, booth where we can actually sit in and talk about Jaws. I watched Jaws just the other day for research, not just for this episode, but for some other things. And I noticed something that came out just, just, it was right there the whole time. And I can't believe I, I can't believe it was there this whole time, just staring right at me. And they said, oh, wow, that, that totally fits. That totally changes the entire arc of a certain character and uh, exciting to see. I'm not going to get into it on this episode, but it, that's, that's all for future episodes that's going to come into play from uh, Stourbridge, UK. See, so Dave writes in with a question. My question is to do, ha- has to do with some of those amateurs. Pratt and his buddies who catch the tiger shark in episode 53. A what? You describe them as typical New England loudmouths and strangers to the island. But in the scene in the dockside, uh, dockside hut, when Brody meets Hooper, I think it's them that Hooper is referring to as the guys who won't get out of the harbor alive. Brody tells Hendrix, you know their first names. Talk to those clowns. If they aren't locals, how does Hendrix know their names? Or is Hooper talking about a different group of guys? See, that's a great question. See, what Dave is talking about, Dave's talking about this scene right here. Let's play that scene here. What are you doing out there? These are your people. Go and talk to them. Those aren't my people. They're from all over the place. Do you see all the license plates out in the parking lot? Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey. I'm all by myself out there. Um, what happened to the extra help we're supposed to That's have? not until the 4th of July. Between now and then, it's you and me. Uh, you know those eight guys in the Fantail launch out there? Yeah? Well, none of them are going to get out of the harbor alive. Lenny, well, that's what I'm talking about. You know their first names. Talk to those clowns. So he says, these are your people. Go and talk to them. People, they're from all over the place. Do you see all the license plates out in the parking lot? Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey. I'm all by myself out there. Um, what-, what Chief is talking about is... Uh, you know those eight guys in the Fantail launch out there? Yeah. Well, none of them are going to get out of the harbor alive. Lenny, well, that's what I'm talking about. You know their first names. Talk to those clowns. Okay, so he's talking about the Fantail launch. So what Chief's talking about is that the the pilots, the owners of those boats are locals. And that's kind of what is going on out there is that there were some, if you read the screenplay, 
that Carl Gottlieb and, and Peter Benchley were working on. There was a lot of deleted scenes that though, that Pratt and his buddies there, there, there's a scene where they're trying to barter with Ben Gardner to take them out to go hunting. And Ben Gardner tells them to take a hike. So they have to move to another boat. So all the, uh, and that's kind of what that, uh, when, when we first get introduced to the scene. Hey, that's not funny. That's not funny at all. Mrs. Kidner must have put her ad to field and stream. It's more like the National Enquirer. Not a Just holler. So that's what's happening is that when they first get introduced to that scene, Brody and Hendricks go up to uh, an actual quarrel. There's a one guy is trying to barter to take a boat out. That's what that argument was over is that they're finding out who some somebody over like some people probably brought more money. So they had a boat scheduled and then the, then they said, well, this guy pays more. So they took them out in his boat. So they were left stranded at the dock. So that's what this scene was originally going to be was were people from out-of-state fishermen that were scrambling aboard and trying to find locals that they could rent their boat rent their boat to take them out to go hunt for the shark to get the three thousand dollar bounty. So what Brody is telling Hendricks about, he said, "Those are your people, as in those owners of those boats are Islanders, and Hendricks is also an Islander as well." So he's got to know the names of those, and they can't be overloading their boats. Who I term as the Jaws Lando is the owner of the boat that Pratt and his buddies, the a what guy, goes out on. That that he is the owner of that of that boat. What are these guys going out here? What are you doing back there, man? Tell us what the hell they're doing back there. Now. They're chilling right now. Tell they're, me, what the hell is that? They're trucking the shark now. Eight miles. Yeah, that guy. That guy is uh, he is a local islander, and uh, they he got uh, he obviously put his boat out for bid, and those guys paid him money, and they, they don't even know what's going on. So he's trying to explain to them about how chumming the shark and and getting the shark to come to them. So that's the t- that guy would be who Hendrix knows. The owners of Hendricks would know Ben Gardner. Hendricks would know other various owners of those boats, and he, that's what Chief Brody is yelling at him to go and talk to. Um, but Hendricks was saying those aren't my people. Then Hendricks is talking about the people that are getting on those boats. Yeah, Hendricks doesn't know them, but he does know the the owners. So Chief's saying, "Come on, get get to get get to getting." So the Chief's telling them to get out there and and at least try to talk to those people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all gonna die. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. And before we get to thinking that that is um, that there's a continuity error or something, because if you see those guys are all climbing down into a launch, it's a, the Hooper calls it a fantail launch, but that boat right there is a smaller boat where they are going to take that and get that out to a larger boat that you see later on that the Jaws Lando is actually uh, piloting. And that is his boat, but that would have been anchored further out in the harbor. And it's common that if you go to the harbors around Cape Cod or the New England area, you will see they don't have enough room. There's not enough slips along the dock for all the boats. So some boats will be just be at anchor right out there in the middle of the harbor. And you would take a little launch to get out to your boat. So that's what these guys are doing. They're overloading that boat, but they're trying to get to a bigger boat where they can actually go and go hunt the shark. And that's what Hooper was talking about, is that those guys are not going to get out of the harbor alive. He says they're going to scuttle the a little launch that they're loading all their equipment up into. Very interesting stuff going on there. And thank you very much, Dave, for that email. I hope that answered your question, Dave, about who uh, Brody is telling Hendricks to go talk to. Because Brody doesn't know. Brody just got to the island. He bought the house in the fall, right? And then this is his first summer. So they they stayed in the winter. So Brody doesn't know the people like Hendricks does. Dave also said, P.S. I'm hoping to be attending the Jaws OB UK meetup at the Robert Shaw in Bolton on July 1st. It's about two and a half hour drive from my house. House, so that's doable. Although driving does mean there'll be no drinking to anyone's legs. I already have my own copy of the book of Quint, but the raffle is in, is a great cause. And if I were to win it, I can think of at least one person who would love to receive a copy of the book as a gift. It will also be great to meet fellow Jaws OB fans. Uh, hopefully there's going to be a good crowd there, though not so many that we need any extra summer deputies. Keep up the good work. Farewell and adieu. Dave in Stourbridge, UK. Dave, I will be seeing you there as well. So exciting, very exciting times. And I think there's going to be a good turnout because 
because we have the West Houghton Historical Society is also going to be in attendance, and they're going to be talking about Robert Shaw and the significance of Robert Shaw to West Houghton. So this is going to be a celebration of Robert Shaw. It's going to be very exciting. I can't wait to meet you, Dave, as well as all the other UK Jaws OB fans as well. It's going to be, what, what a time. It's going to be great. So that's July 1st. See you there. We had a great five-star rating and review over at Apple Podcasts. And a great comment over there by Sarah TB, five-star rating. She says, finally found the one with exclamation marks. This is the podcast I have been looking for. This movie is something so special to us all, and it is hard to put into words. This podcast does so. It has been my favorite movie since I was five. Quint and my dad have the identical have the identical personality. For a kid whose dad did not talk much about his military experience, this movie taught me a lot. And now I'm a 21-year military veteran myself. Thanks for highlighting and doing such an amazing job talking about the greatest movie ever. So glad I found you. Sarah, thank you so much. Sarah TB, thank you so much for writing in, for uh, leaving that five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And it's such a great review. Thank you very much for your 21-year military service. Quint has become a family member to many people. And then Quint reminds Sarah of her dad. They have identical personalities. When you read the details of Quint's life in the book of Quint, my hope is that it makes you appreciate the character of Quint that much more. And we've sort of done that on the Jaws Obsession as well with episode 18, Quint's Death Explained. We sort of did that as well with, if you know the history of what Quint's telling us, he's telling uh, Chief Brody and Hooper about his injuries. And if you know those injuries and what he's talking about, his arm, it's that, that it changes the way you watch the movie. That is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the history of Quint and how you will experience that character going forward if you know the full history. And uh, and and that, of course, is the Book of Quint. So thank you very much, um, Sarah TB, for leaving that five-star review. Please, if uh, and those five-star reviews really do help the algorithm, uh, when you reach a certain level of five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, then it kicks you up into the search ranks and therefore new listeners come to the show. So if you haven't yet, go to the platform of the broadcast that you're listening on and leave us a good review. I would really appreciate that. That would be exceptional. Thank you very much, Sarah TB. That will do it for the emails and for the Jaws news. And now let's get into the meat of episode 62, Jaws Dogs. Canine element of Jaws is very apparent. So from time to time, we always do get an email about Pippet the dog. And uh, I always promised that we were going to do a Pippet episode of the Jaws Obsession. This was way back when in March of last year, March of 2022, listener Ed from Vallejo, California, right next to Mare Island Naval Shipyard, he wrote in, he said, I know he's not a person, but all, everyone always forgot Pippet. And he was responding to our episode 14, the Jaws trivia question, where we were fi we were figuring out how many victims did the shark claim in Jaws. I was emphasizing human victims, but um, Pippet was kind of left off to the side. So yes, Pippet is definitely a victim of the shark. And uh, we're going to give Pippet uh, a, a very big highlight on this episode. Recently, Chris wrote in from Woodstock, Illinois. Chris wrote in and said, hey, Ryan. Love the podcast, just discovered it literally three weeks ago and have binged every episode at work and I'm already caught up. Amazing stuff. Now, although I'm stoked to see what happens with the Book of Quint in book form and film as well, I have a question for you. I have always considered Pippet a victim, even though the poor pup wasn't a human. Now, my question is this. Do you believe Pippet was taken by the shark pre-Alex? And what are your opinions of Pippet's owner? Was he an islander or a tourist? What was his backstory? What happened to him after that day? As a Jaws fan, this was one of those things that always made me think. Anyway, love the show, and I hope I get to read the Book of Quint sooner than later and hope to see the film as well. Cheers, Chris from Woodstock, Illinois. Thanks for writing in, Chris. Yes, we're going to answer all these questions today because we can, using clues in the movie Jaws, we can find little bits that, um, that at least lead us into some little bit of details into the not, not just Pippet, but the owner of Pippet. What does Pippet mean to the Jaws universe? 
it is it is interesting that that Pippet does serve a function for how we perceive Amity Island. And we're going to get into that right now. But aside from Pippet, there are other dogs in Jaws. That's why we called this episode 62, Jaws Dogs. Uh, John Tedder and I, uh, we were going through the movie. John Tedder did a great uh, investigative part where he found there's actually 13 dogs that are in Jaws. And he made a mosaic of all the 13 appearances of Canine cinematic canines in the movie Jaws. And I'm going to put this on our show notes. You can go to uh, our Telegram channel, at Jaws OB, to look at our show notes, and you'll see the mosaic of all the different dogs that are in Jaws. Pippa is not the only one. So there are cameos. There's puppies in the background. There's uh, there's There are dogs throughout Jaws. Obviously, director Steven Spielberg was a dog owner, and throughout Jaws, he was very keen on having uh, having dogs as a sidekick to the human throughout the movie. So there are 13 dogs, but we're going to focus on three of them, three dogs. So the three main dogs, if you had a supporting cast of 13 dogs in Jaws, you have three dogs that are focused on. We'll save Pippet for last, since we have the most information on Pippet. But for the first one, I want to talk about the Brody's family dogs. As as you'll see at the beginning of Jaws, yeah, you will see the Brody's have a pet cocker spaniel that is sitting on the bed waiting to be fed in the morning when uh, Chief Brody wakes up with his wife, Ellen. How come the sun didn't used to shine in here? I bought the house in the fall. This is summer. So this is the line right here. There's somebody feed the dogs. Right. There's somebody feed the dogs. Somebody feed the dogs. She says, somebody feed the dogs, plural, dogs. So there is one dog in the frame. And as we see throughout the movie, uh, when Chief Brody leaves the house. Gotta go. Missing person. Season hasn't started. Nobody's even here yet. And Michael uh, Brody runs around with his snorkeling equipment to go swimming. And uh, Chief and Ellen are walking out. You see the family dog uh, let out of the front door. That uh, that dog actually belongs to Steven Spielberg. I'm going to refer to uh, Carl Gottlieb's... Um, so the Brodies actually had two family dogs. And uh, I will refer to Carl Gottlieb's The Jaws Log. Uh, I have the 25th anniversary edition here. On page 73, Carl Gottlieb writes, Rick Fields, Stephen's assistant, had gone on ahead with Steven, with Steve's two dogs, Elmer and Zalman, and had set things up so the place was ready when we arrived. Uh, on the end note here, he says, in the, bonus, in the bonus materials on the Jaws DVD, there's a deleted scene showing, mor- showing mourning in the Brody household in which Stephen's dogs... Elmer and Zalman play themselves and can be seen briefly on camera and being fed by Ellen Brody. Uh, that would be this scene right here. There is a deleted scene out there on YouTube. If you if you just do a short uh, if you do a search for Jaws deleted scenes, you can find her. She uh, where Ellen's feeding the two family dogs, and this is uh, where she says their names. Okay, guys, come on. Elmer, Zalman. Here we go. Okay, guys, come on. So Elmer and Zalman, those are Steven Spielberg's Cocker Spaniels, uh, and they actually doubled as Brody's dogs. Now, I was a little uh, hesitant that, okay, so you have we have to be careful now when we're using deleted scenes. We really don't want to use deleted scenes as canon to Jaws. We really want to say what's what's in Jaws is the theatrical release. That's the canon part. If you didn't know, if you just watched the theatrical release, you would always just see one dog at a time in the Brody household. But because Ellen uses the plural dogs, Why somebody feed the dogs? Right. Because there's a plural there, so it is canon that the Brodies did have two dogs, two Cocker Spaniels, and their names were Elmer and Zalman, the real names that Steven Spielberg gave to his two dogs that play them in the movie. But we only see one at a time. They will both be that uh, number three highlighted dog in the movie Jaws. So Elmer or Zalman, Z-A-L-M-A-N, were the name of Brody's family dogs. The other time we see one of the dogs is when Ellen scares Martin while he's studying on sharks. (laughs) 
You know, Alan, people don't even know how old sharks are. Yeah, so they live two, three thousand years. So there's a family dog sitting there on the sofa uh, right behind Ellen. So we do know that Steven Spielberg had a fondness for dogs. Zalman would end up going to, let's see here. Carl Gottlieb also wrote about, uh, he said that, as I recall, eating was their favorite activity on screen and off. Uh, Zalman used to bite kids, and Stephen eventually gave him to Rick Fields. So Stephen ended up passing the more aggressive Zalman off to his assistant, Rick Fields, and Elmer would go on to be in a few other of Spielberg's movies, like Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So the second most important dog in Jaws would be the poodle that was owned by Herschel West. Is the Herschel West is the real-life fisherman from Menemsha, the fishing town on Am on Martha's Vineyard. And if you remember, Herschel would be following around Quint as Quint's first mate. And in this scene, when we first are introduced to Quint... Y'all know me. Know how I earn a living. So in that scene, you actually see Herschel standing up against the door, and there is a poodle curled up sitting next to his legs on a leash. And later on, we see Herschel's dog as Quint exits the scene in the town hall. We'll, uh, we'll... Take it under advisement. Mr. Mayor, Chief, ladies and gentlemen. So you hear the leash and the little dog following with his footsteps behind Herschel and Quint as they exit the Amity Town Hall. I found the name of that dog uh, was on page 63 of the making of the movie Jaws on location on Martha's Vineyard, the making of the movie Jaws by Edith Blake. So in Edith Blake's book on page 63, she writes, Quint's mate had been hastily turned into Herschel West with his miniature poodle Topper. Uh, the minute Sherry had discovered him at Menemsha, Herschel was delighted to be in the plot. He and his dog were getting actor's pay, which was $135 a day, and the longer production dragged on, the better he liked it. Later, he would be transporting the generator on his own boat, and at, the, at that point showed off a check for $1,400 for the week. So she highlights that Herschel West's miniature poodle was named Topper. So that is the name of the dog that we see in Jaws following Quint and Herschel around. This is all very interesting. It's all This is all connected. For that, we need to go to page 49 of Jaws, Memories from Martha's Vineyard, the book by Matt Taylor. If we go to page 49, he has a comment here by Herschel West. Now let's get into this. here. So Herschel West, uh, obviously the actor that plays Herschel Salvatore in the movie Jaws. So Herschel goes on to say, at first I was only getting to be an extra on one of the boats, and I was for one day. On the second day, I went down to the set with my dog. I started getting into an old cat boat with Spielberg, and one of the fellows on the boat went to pick up my dog. I said, don't touch her. She'll go on her own. That dog would follow me and do anything I said. Spielberg liked that and asked me if I'd take a speaking part as Quint's first mate. He said he wanted me and my dog to follow Robert Shaw everywhere he went. I told him yes. So really, the dog got me the job. Now, that is a groundbreaking revelation there, that that little poodle that you see in Jaws is the reason why Spielberg cast Herschel West as Quint's first mate. They were looking for a first mate for Quint, and in Edith Blake's book, back on page 63, she says that Sherry Rhodes had discovered Herschel at Menemsha, replacing and cast him, replacing a 20-year-old girl previously planned for the role. So Quint's uh, sidekick was going to be a 20-year-old girl at one point. So if you think about it, the whole line, the whole f narrative that we know of Jaws, and, and, and from a personal standpoint, Herschel plays a huge role in the book of Quint, and I zeroed in on that character. Without Herschel West, without that poodle there... Spielberg never would have really seen how the poodle, how that little dog reacts with Herschel West. And then he just said, hey, this is really, he zeroed in on something from that. And he said, okay, something told him right there that this guy needs to be Quint's first mate. 
And look at that. That was the stone in the pond and the ripple effect extended far out all the way until how we're talking about him right now. So, so that dog is extremely important to the Jaws timeline. In fact, in how we perceive the movie Jaws, without that little poodle named Topper, could things have turned out different? Might have. We ne we'll never know, but that's, that's just amazing how things work out like that. So that is the number two most important dog in the movie Jaws, that little miniature poodle named Topper, which was uh, the actual real-life dog of Herschel West, who went on to play Herschel Salvatore. If you want to know more about Herschel Salvatore and uh, Quint's sidekick there, go to Jaws Obsession episode 29, Who is Herschel Salvatore? And we go into a deep dive into his sidekick. And what does he mean to the Jaws universe, especially with the Book of Quint? So now we know about Topper. We know about Elmer and Zalman, the Brody's dogs. So now let's go to the most famous dog in the Jaws universe, Pippet. We're going to break this down. The Pippet discussion will break down into two aspects. Uh, we're going to go with Pippet in real life, the dog that was cast, what her history was. And then we're going to go to Pippet in the Jaws universe. We're going to break down what is happening with... Uh, Pippet on that beach, what happens, and also the owner. Uh, can we dis can we get any clues and uh, into the Jaws universe from Pippet's appearance and disappearance? Uh, let's talk about the name first, the name Pippet. What is a Pippet? So the American Pippet is a type of bird nesting in the far north and on mountaintops. American Pippets can be found throughout the continent during migration or winter. At those seasons... They are usually in flocks, walking on shores or plowed fields, wagging their tails as they go. Uh, so that's a type of uh, singing bird, has a very distinct singing sound. Now, now, what's interesting here is let's play what does a sound of a, what does a pipit sound like? How does a pipit, the bird pipit sound? Very interesting. Where have we heard those sounds before? These are. This is an American pipit. Where have we heard these sounds before? Let's go back to the very beginning of Jaws. Very interesting. They do. That they do have a similar sound. If you want to go back to those Jaws opening sounds, you go back to episode one of the Jaws. Obsession. I tried to break down and actually analyze how they made those sounds and actually what those sounds represent. So that is what an American Pippet is, and that's where the dog Pippet got her name. And that's right, it's a her. That is a female dog, Pippet. On page 179 of the same book, Jaws Memories from Martha's Vineyard by Matt Taylor, page 179, I'll read a little bit from here. It says, Perhaps the least challenging Islander cast for a role in Jaws one who didn't demand roles for her friends and had nothing at all to say about the script was Pippet, the Labrador Retriever, beloved pet of Edo and Robert Potter of Chappaquiddick. Cast for a game of fetch on State Beach, the boisterous retriever accompanied by her master's 17-year-old son, Stephen, would dog paddle her way into, the, into movie history as Martha's Vineyard's second most famous black dog. So it goes here to quote, uh, Stephen Potter is the name of the actor that uh, that's the owner of, that he was the 17-year-old son of the two owners of Pippet. That's the young man in the yellow shirt that's throwing the stick for the dog in the movie. His name is Stephen Potter. So from here on out, we'll call that character Stephen. Uh, our family got Pippet in 1969 when I was oh, about 13. One of the things I remember about going to pick her out was throwing a tennis ball into the litter of puppies. She was the one who chased it, and so we said, that's the one we'll take. She was a phenomenal retriever. There are labs that are sort of slow and dopey, and others that just live to retrieve. She was one of those. Mrs. Potter goes on to say that uh, sometime during the spring of 1974, I got a call from my niece who worked at a kennel in Edgartown. Edgartown is the town that doubled for Amity the town of Amity, and Jaws. She said they were looking for a dog for Jaws that was really enthusiastic, really vigorous. So I spoke with Sherry Rhodes and told her I was willing to allow Pippet in the movie, but that I wanted to know who would be handling her. And so Mrs. Potter got her son Stephen into the movie to be Pippet's owner. Now Stephen uh, says earlier in the spring, I had actually auditioned for the role Jonathan Philly wound up getting. So Stephen actually auditioned for the role of Cassidy, uh, Chrissy Watkins' friend that uh, passes out on the beach 
that went to Jonathan Philly, uh, but Stephen Potter was actually auditioned for that role. So he almost got that. Uh, it says He says, um, but when they called me back for a second reading, I was off island. So that opportunity had come and gone. Originally, the shots they were planning with Pippet called for an old man as her owner. But then my mother suggested me for the part, and because of my earlier contact with the production, Sherry Rhodes had some sense of who I was and said, sure, that'd be, that would be great. So uh, originally, they were going to have an old man as uh, the owner of the dog, and Stephen was cast instead. So that role, it became a younger role right there, which is very interesting. You see how things like that work out, is that because Stephen did not get the role as Cassidy, uh, that went to the actor Jonathan Philly. So he wasn't doing anything, and then this was the Pippet the dog, and then Stephen wasn't in the movie yet, so they were able to put him as the Pippet's owner. So the yellow shirt, uh, the yellow shirt young man is actually there because Jaws was making itself, and that's what happens here. Is that is that the movie as we know it never would have been had Stephen Potter been there for that second callback for that second reading. Maybe he would have gotten the 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 he would have been passed out on the beach, and then next thing you know, you'd have an older man as Pippet's owner, and maybe it would have had a different feel for the scene. As we're going to come up, we're going to break that scene down just a little bit. And we're going to show that um, that Stephen's uh, a presence there actually tells us some things about the beach, which is really interesting. I like this one sequence. Now, when I met uh, Jeff Voorhees, who plays Alex Kittner in the movie, he told this story uh, to me about him and uh, Lee Fierro, who is the actress that played Mrs. Kittner, and how they were in charge of keeping Pippet the dog quiet while on set. And here is a very neat little breakdown of that on page 181 of Memories from Martha's Vineyard. Stephen Potter, the young man in the yellow shirt, Stephen says, my only dialogue in the film was calling for my dog who's been chasing a stick into the water and has suddenly disappeared. That was one of the first things they shot for the scene. The thing about Pippet was she'd react extremely eagerly whenever you'd call her name, particularly when she thought you had something to throw to her. We had just finished shooting at a number of takes of Pippet chasing the stick, and so not only was she still on the beach, but she was extremely wound up, and it was just hysterical because I was looking out at the water, trying to look concerned about my missing dog, and every time I'd call Pippet's name, she'd respond by barking from just a few yards behind the camera. She couldn't go anywhere because a crew member was holding her by the collar, and so her yips and yelps were getting more and more eager with each take. So Lee Fierro, the, uh, the lady that played Mrs. Kittner, uh, she recalls, she says, at the request of one of the assistant directors, Jeff Voorhees, the, the, um, the 12-year-old boy that played Alex Kittner, and I took Pippet up over the dunes and held her ears so they could continue filming, without her barking every time her master called her name. It was very funny. If you can imagine while they're filming that and he's yelling for, uh, he's calling for Pippet, Mrs. Kittner and Alex Kittner are in the back holding the dog's ears closed so she wouldn't hear the calling and wouldn't, wouldn't bark and ruin the take. What a sweet little moment. Uh, that was one of my favorite stories that uh, Jeff Voorhees, the actor who played Alex Kittner, um, told me when I met him on Martha's Vineyard. Another fact is in 1974, Stephen and Pippet were paid $500 for their role in the movie. So they both made $500 for that scene, the dog and Stephen. And Pippet would go on to live till 1978. That was Pippet the dog. So now let's let's break down this scene here as we uh, let's dive into this scene from Jaws. 13 minutes and 42 seconds into the movie, we're going to see our first glimpse of Pippet the dog and Stephen, the owner, man in the yellow shirt. He throws the stick out. Uh, we At the same time, Alex Kittner is coming out of the water. But what we do see in the background is we see, we see the couple also walking in. Now, this couple is the screaming lady whose boyfriend is fooling around with her and scares her under the water later on in the scene. Uh, but they're going in at the same time at 13 minutes and 42 seconds. So if you watch that really quick, it's very passing because the camera's tracking with Alex Kittner. But we see uh, Stephen and Pippet and the couple walking in at the same time. Here. Hey. Maddie, here's the baby. Here. So Alex Kittner walks up to his mom. Go back out in the water. 
water? Let me see your fingers. Oh, Alex Kintner, they're beginning to prune. Just let me go out a little longer. Alex Kintner uh, goes up to his mom, and then we go over to Chief Brody. You're not an island. Maybe That's it. So now it goes back, it goes from Chief Brody back to the beach, and Stephen throws the stick towards the couple that just went into the water, okay? Now, in my, in my interpretation of this scene and in the Jaws universe, I do believe that they are all together. I believe that these are islanders and that they all know each other. See, right now, the beaches are closed, effectively, so these, so who you see on this beach, they're kind of community folks. They're people that all know each other or have been around each other. So what happens is, is that Stephen throws that, Stephen throws that stick over towards the couple that's in the water, and Pippet the dog goes bounding into the water towards that couple. Now Pippet the dog grabs the stick and is swimming back. And this is what we. This is this is very interesting. This is going to go. This is going to show us uh, highlight on the sound design of the movie and how it was changed with later editions of Jaws. And this is very interesting. Now listen to this. So Pippet the dog is swimming back with the stick. <laughs> And the man that's with the girl in the the couple there, that man leaves her and swims over to Pippet the dog. And if you listen, you can hear a little bit of a laugh there. (laughs) So if you hear that little laugh, that little chuckle the man makes as he's swimming over, (laughs) this tells me, and also the dog's reaction is she's swimming back Pippet the dog is swimming back with the stick and the man is playing with her. So this tells me that everyone is together here. This is all from the original stereo soundtrack off of Jaws from 1975. So I'm going to go switch over now to the new 7.1 surround sound. Now listen to the scene with the new surround sound with the reissued soundtrack. That's it. That's all you get. Man swims up. So it there is there is no chuckle. That that the chuckle has been removed and replaced with just thrashing water sounds. And so what happens is is that if you were to watch Jaws for the first time using this enhanced soundtrack and that chuckle is not there, you would think that the man is angry at Pippet, or you would think that this man is just swimming over there because the dog splashed him and his girlfriend, or something else is going on. But you, if without that laugh, that chuckle, <laughs> that's an important clue to show that these this is a community, and Stephen, uh, the, the, the man in the yellow shirt, is I believe is together with this couple because they're both walking to the water at the same time. Pippet, the dog, and Stephen are walking to the water's edge as that couple is walking in as well. So they all decided to go for a swim. And if you remember back in the with Jaws Obsession episode six, the sound of a great white. If you remember, uh, we we talked about the reissued soundtrack on Jaws and how it adds uh, unwanted elements to the movie. And this is just another example, the the swimming man over to Pippet, uh, by not including his laugh, you change the uh, feeling of that scene. That is why on the Jaws Obsession here, we will you will always hear only the sound, only the sound from the original stereo soundtrack from the 1975 release of Jaws will only be used on this show because we are trying to get to the Jaws universe, expanded Jaws universe of what was intended by the filmmakers and the sound design at that time. I believe that as a Jaws community that we should protect this original soundtrack of Jaws. Any new releases or reissues in the future should have the original stereo soundtrack as the default sound for the movie. If you want to switch over to 7.1 or 5.1 surround sound or whatever the bells and whistles you want, feel free to do that. But 
really the first and only impression that you should have of this movie is the original soundtrack to actually get the original feel of what Steven Spielberg intended. Also, it shows you the importance of having a hard copy of Jaws or to have physical media still. Because right now, if you watch Jaws on uh, Turner Classic Movies or if you watch Jaws when it's broadcast on television, when it is reissued and shown in theaters, you will have a different soundtrack. You will have a, there, there is a different experience if it's on Netflix. So what happens is, is the modern day generation of uh, moviegoers and film watchers, if they were to watch Jaws for the first time, they'll miss that little chuckle that man does as he swims over to Pippet. <laughs> that little chuckle. They also put in other uh, dog dog barks that that are not in the original soundtrack. They changed the scene. You might not know the intentions of that man sw swimming over towards Pippet, but they are all friendly. They are all together. That little chuckle shows you that he's having fun with the dog as well. And why would Steven throw that stick in the direction of that couple, pretty much on top of the couple almost, so the dog is making a beeline right for that couple? Why would he do that if they're not all together? And that shows you the community. That shows you the tightness. Also, the smaller condensed population that is Amity outside of those summer hours, that when the 4th of July starts, those tourists are going to hit like a wave when the ferry season picks up and the ferry lines are added for after the 4th of July, you're going to see the beach explode with population. So right now, everybody kind of knows each other because these are, these are, these are islanders. And that is very important to focus on. Uh, that that Stephen, the Pippet, the dog owner, and that couple out in the water know each other. So let's continue on with the scene. So 14 minutes and 46 seconds. That's going to be our last glimpse of Pippet, the dog. We're going to have to assume that Stephen is tossing the stick a few more times while this exchange with Mr. Thompson and Chief Brody go on as well as the exchange with Bad Hat Harry. Harry Kiesel comes up and that goes on. So we don't know we, we don't know how many times the stick was thrown into the water and retrieved. But what we do see here is one of the important elements that Pippet the dog brings to the Jaws universe is that Pippet established is is a device that establishes the geography of the moment. It gives a chance for Steven Spielberg to survey the beach. So instead of looking off to the west where the rock jetty is and the estuary entrance is, now we get that shot of the long curving beach uh, that is this part of Amity Island because director Spielberg takes that alternate angle and shows Steven wrestling the stick out of Pippet's mouth. You get that emptier beach. And also we see lifeguard chairs that are not manned. So that means the beaches are closed. This is how our, so for visually what we're given is a before to the 4th of July's after. When we come back to this same beach on the 4th of July, there's lifeguards and red jackets at all the lifeguard chairs. The beach is, is packed to the hilt and it's and it's extended all the way down. So what Pippet the dog allows Steven Spielberg to do is to give those alternate takes and actually go through the beach. They they claim they said that they were filming a lot with the dog. Uh, that was one of the first things they did. So there was a lot of B-roll footage that Verna Fields had to ha had to work with. And if Jaws were to be longer, I'm sure there would have been more establishing shots with the dog. So it, it gives some action while you're establishing the area. And that's what the dog was able, that's what Pippa the dog was able to bring to the Jaws universe. Without her, then it would, uh, then, uh, th then those shots would have just been, there would have been no activity or action to justify those frames and those angles of the, of the vast empty beach. It's very quick. But that is an important, important establishing shot showing this empty beach looking, uh, looking east instead of west uh, down Amity Island. And Pippet the dog gives us that. The other thing that this shows is just how small Amity is. Now, there are only two beaches are shown in the movie Jaws, two swimming beaches in a way. Uh, we have South Beach, okay, 
where, where the Chrissy Watkins attack occurs. That's South Beach. So we see campfires. We see heavy wave activity. We, uh, uh, that's, that's called South Beach. Uh, those are where the beach clothes signs are put up. There is a set of cabanas, the changing rooms, over on South Beach. You see that later on when Hendrix is blowing the whistle. You see those cabanas in the background. That's, uh, that's South Beach. Now this is, you, we can call it Estuary Beach. You can call it State Beach because State Beach is the name of the beach where they filmed it. But this is an alternate beach. But it is also, this is probably the main swimming beach of Amity because why? Because this is where Chief is going with his family. This is where all the islanders are. And then later on with the 4th of July, this is where all, this is where all the activity is. This is where all the people come to go swimming. This is where they get the Coast Guard spotters. This is where they get all the boats out there to patrol because this is the main swimming beach of Amity. Amity is not that large of an island. And without this scene, without the Pippet the dog scene, we don't get that juxtaposition. So we get we we might think that Amity is the size of Martha's Vineyard, and there are many beaches on Martha's Vineyard. No, this is a smaller island. It's a more intimate setting, and that is what the Pippet the dog scene brings to the Jaws universe. It establishes this, this. It establishes this context that this is the main swimming beach of Amity, and Amity is not that big because it really only has two beaches. Now, later on in Jaws 2, a third beach is established. There are probably roads built that let you to go east to East Beach, which is more of a white, sandy area, and that is where it is right on that, that edge of Cape Scott. If you look at the map of Amity Island included in the Book of Quint, that map of Amity Island has Cape Scott is that su- it's that on the eastern end it's that part that juts out from the eastern end of the island that is where the sailboats the kids in the sailboats in Jaws 2 swing around that I- that that cape because the currents and the winds are very fun and very strong those isolated beaches are right there where we see Eddie and Tina at where the uh, dead orca whale uh, the dead killer whale washes up on shore. There's a lighthouse over there. But there is a beach over there that's established later on in Jaws 2. Not to be confused with the beach that's where we're at in the Alex Kittner beach here. Okay, so now there's three beaches we're going to be focused on if you want to add Jaws 2 into the lexicon. But right now, for Amity Island, in Jaws, we're only focused on two beaches. And this Pip at the Dog Beach is where... All the activity happens because that's where everybody congregates when all the tourists come there and the mayor goes down there and everybody in the helicopter patrols, they're all on this beach. Shows you just how small Amity is. And that's what Pippa the dog brings. It's almost a full two minutes after the last time we see her. Stephen, uh, the Pippa the dog owner, is calling for her. <laughs> So if you look at that sequence and you see where Sean Brody is and where Stephen is, uh, you have to think that the couple fooling around the uh, in the water, if you look later on, they move further down. If you look after the panic on the beach ensues, so okay, so he's he's calling for uh, he's calling for Pippet who never returns, and we see the stick floating in the water. So what I do derive from this is that he took one final throw, one final heave on that stick, and threw it out into deeper water. So he threw that in, and as the dog was paddling out for the stick, that's when the shark took Pippet in the way she the in the way uh, the shark takes the estuary victim just pulls pulls her right down unfortunately yes Pippet becomes a victim of the shark why how do we know this I know there's some theories where people think oh did she run away and she's seen on the jaws bridge when chief Brody's running down the jaws bridge there's a lab there it looks like a lab there uh, or could the uh, could she have sensed danger or run away? Uh, those are nice little theories, but the logic says if you know a retriever, uh, my parents raised chocolate labs, 
they will not leave something out there. And when you throw something, they're going to go get that. And there's no way Pippet the dog leaves that stick out there. I don't care what happens. That that retriever was going to go get that. And so by that stick being out there means that the dog, that Pippet the dog unfortunately met her demise, can be listed as one of the victims of Bruce the shark in Jaws. Very sad to see, but it also shows that no nobody is safe now because now we lose a, a dog. We're going to lose a child. Uh, 12-year-old Alex Kittner is going to get uh, taken by the shark. So it's going to leave everybody in the theater on edge. All those safety, uh, safety uh, characters in movies of past are no more. This shark is relentless. And it will go for anybody. It already took the damsel in distress. Then it takes the young, and then it takes the dog. Now it takes the young boy. So we're into danger territory here. There's one thing to note during the panic, and I don't want to get too far into this because the panic on the beach can be an episode in itself. There's a lot of things going on as the people are running out. There's a lot of characters. There's a lot of different aspects to analyze there. But one thing to analyze is. Yeah, when Chief Brody's screaming to get everybody out, you see Stephen Pippa, the dog owner, run straight to one, uh, like a 12 or 13 year old boy and grab him, pulling him out. And then you see in the far back, you see the uh, couple, the couple that was horsing around in the water, they're walking out as well. And uh, what's happened, what, what it shows you is that that's a shallow section. There's almost a shallow shelf underneath the water there. When, uh, when that lady screams earlier... Some cats parking in front of the house. I can't get down to the office. And that garbage truck next to the office has got to be You can see that they are in shallower water right there. There is a little bit of a shelf where they're playing... And what happened, what I believe happened is that the, the great white at this time is cruising in the deep water just off of the shelf. Anyone that goes swimming there now, if you go to this location in Martha's Vineyard and you want to go take a swim, it drops off. It is a steep drop off just offshore. It's not too far. All you have to do is swim out about 20 or 30 feet offshore and uh, you're in seven, eight feet of water. It just keeps dropping off there. So uh, what theoretically happened is the shark is cruising in the deeper water off the drop off there. And Stephen threw the stick over into that deeper water away from where this uh, couple is because he lifts her up on his shoulders. So he's actually standing right there. And if you watch the evacuation when the panic ensues and everybody is running out, look in the back. You can see that couple coming out of the back uh, in the background. They're actually, they actually work their way down the beach into a more shallower area where you can stand and they're walking out where it's shallow and they can stand there. So in the Jaws universe, there is a drop-off there, and the shark is cruising around that drop-off. And that's where Pippa the dog gets taken, and that's why you see the legs dangling, and then Alex Kittner is way far out. He is obviously, obviously over the drop-off, and that's how he gets taken by the shark as well. So unfortunately, that last throw by Stephen is what caused Pippa's demise. Very unfortunate, but... He was still there to go out and make a beeline right for uh, th some uh, a 12 or 13-year-old. Could that be his younger brother? We don't know. But we do know that all these people are somewhat together. Everybody kind of knows each other. And we do know that the shark fin brothers are on that beach as well. The boys that have these fake shark fin, uh, they are on that beach as well in that cluster of kids. So there's a lot more going on in that beach scene with Pippet then we might know. If you want to know more about the Sharkfin Brothers, go to uh, Jaws Obsession episode 30 to learn more about what's going on, why are they on that beach, and what is going on there uh, with them. So many things to learn in the movie Jaws, and the Jaws dogs, the dogs of Jaws, can teach us a lot about not only the Jaws universe, 
but how much Jaws was making itself, it wasn't pre-planned. It was the product of people being in the perfect place at the perfect time. Wonderful to understand that. It just makes us appreciate this movie that much more. Thank you very much for listening. This has been Episode 62, Jaws Dogs. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired, I want to go to bed. I had a little drink about an hour ago, where the sky might do my head. Wherever I may roam, by land or sea or home. There we have it. That was the Pippet the Dog episode. And Thank you very much. That was This was inspired by all the emails that I've received over the past many months. Remember about the July 1st, 2023 Jaws Obsession UK Meetup presentation of the Book of Quint to West Houghton. There's an Eventbrite link that will be listed on our website and also in the description of the broadcast below that you can follow to reserve a general admission to the event. The admission is free. Can't wait to see everyone there. I will be there, so it's going to be exciting to see all the UK listeners and UK Jaws fans at our first public Jaws Obsession event. Very exciting. The movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. The copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of, criti- purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the Fair Use Guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act, all rights reserved to the copyright owners. Thank you very much for listening to this week. You can always reach me here at jawsob2025 at gmail.com. Until next week, farewell and adieu, and show me the way to go home. <laughs>